Okay, so let me, uh, let's go like far into the future. Let's imagine this gigantic neuromorphic computing system that uh, simulates all of our realities. It currently is, we mentioned Matrix 4. So this thing, uh, this powerful computer, how does it operate? Like, so, so what, what are the neurons? What is the communication? What's your sense? So All right, so let me, let me now, af after spending 45 minutes trashing light source integration with silicon, let me <laughs> now say why I'm basing my entire life, yeah. professional life on integrating light sources with electronics. Mm -hmm. I think the game is completely different when you're talking about superconducting electronics. Mm -hmm. For several reasons, um, let me try to go through them. Mm -hmm. One is that, as I mentioned, it's difficult to integrate those compound semiconductor light sources with silicon. With silicon is a requirement that is introduced by the fact that you're using semiconducting electronics. Mm -hmm. In superconducting electronics, you're still gonna start with a silicon wafer, but it's it's just the bread for your sandwich in, in a lot of ways. You're not using that silicon in precisely the same way for the electronics. You're now depositing superconducting materials on top of that. The prospects for integrating light sources with that kind of an electronic process are certainly less explored, but I think much more promising because you don't need those light sources to be intimately integrated with the transistors. That's where the problems mm -hmm. come up. They don't need to be lattice matched to the silicon, all, all that kind of stuff. Instead, it seems possible that you can take those compound semiconductor light sources, stick them on the silicon wafer, and then grow your superconducting electronics on the top of that. It's at least not obviously going to fail. So the computation would be done on the super, uh, superconductive material as well? Y yes, yeah, so the computation is done in the superconducting electronics and the light sources receive signals that say, hey, a neuron reached threshold, produce a pulse of light, send it out to all your downstream synaptic connections. Those are again, superconducting, ele superconducting electronics, perform your computation, and you're off to the races, your, your network works. So then if we can rewind real quick, so what are the limitations of the challenges of superconducting electronics when we think about constructing these kinds of systems? So actually, let me, let me say a, a, one other thing about the light sources. Yes, please. And then I'll then I'll move on. I promise, because this is this is probably tedious for some. This is super exciting. Okay, one other thing about the light sources. I said that silicon is terrible at emitting photons. It's yeah. just not what it's meant to do. However, the game is different when you're at low temperature. If you're working with superconductors, you have to be at low temperature because they don't work otherwise. When you're at four Kelvin, silicon is not obviously a terrible light source. It's still not as efficient as compound semiconductors, but it might be good enough for this application. The final thing that I'll mention about that is, again, leveraging superconductors, as I said, in, in a different context, superconducting detectors can receive one single photon. In that conversation, I failed to mention that semiconductors can also receive photons. That's the primary mechanism by which oh. it's done. A, a camera in your phone that's receptive to visible right. light is receiving photons. It's based on silicon, or you can make it in different semiconductors for different wavelengths, but it requires on the order of a thousand, a few thousand photons to receive a pulse. Now, when you're using a superconducting detector, you need one photon, exactly one. I mean one or more. Mm -hmm. So the fact that your synapses can now be based on superconducting detectors instead of semiconducting detectors brings the light levels that are required down by some three orders of magnitude. Mm -hmm. So now you don't need good light sources. You can have the world's worst light sources as long as they spit out maybe a few thousand photons every time a neuron fires, you have the hard, you have the hardware principles in place that you might be able to do perform this optoelectronic integration. Mm -hmm. To me, optoelectronic integration is it's just so enticing. We want to be able to leverage electronics for computation, light for communication, working with silicon microelectronics at room temperature that has been exceedingly difficult. And I hope that when we move to the superconducting domain, target a different application space that is neuromorphic instead of digital and use superconducting detectors, maybe optoelectronic integration comes to us. Okay, so there's a bunch of questions. There. So one is temperature. So in these kind of hybrid heterogeneous systems, what's the temperature? What are some of the constraints to the operation here? Did, does it all have to be at four Kelvin as well? Four Kelvin. Everything has to be at four Kelvin. 
Okay, so what are the other engineering challenges of making this kind of optoelectronic systems? Let me just dwell on that four Kelvin for a second sure. because some people hear four Kelvin and they just get up and leave. They just say, I don't, I'm not doing it, you know? Yeah. And to me, that's very earth-centric, species-centric. We live in 300 Kelvin, so we want our technologies to operate there too. I totally get it. Yeah, what's zero Celsius? Zero is Celsius is 273 Kelvin. Okay. So okay. we're talking very, very, very cold. cold here. This is- this Not is, even Boston cold. No. <laughs> this, is, this is real cold. Yeah. This is Siberia cold. We're, no. but, okay, so just for reference, the, the temperature of the cosmic microwave background is about 2.7 Kelvin. So okay. we're still warmer than deep space. Yeah. Good. So, so that when the universe dies out, it'll be colder than 4K. It's already colder than 4K. In the in the expanses, you know, you don't have to get that far away from the Earth in order to to drop down to not far from 4K. So what you're saying is the aliens that live at the edge of the observable universe are using superconductive material for their computation. They don't have to live at the edge of the universe. The aliens that are more advanced than us in their solar system are doing this in their asteroid belt. We can get to that. Oh, because of the, they can get that to that temperature easier there? Sure, yeah. Okay. All you have to do is reflect the sunlight away and, and you, you have a huge head start. Oh, so the sun is the problem here. Yeah. Like it's warm here on earth. Got yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So can you, uh, so how do we get to 4K? What's... Well, the, okay, so what, what very I want different to say, kind what of 4K. I want to say about temperature, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what I want to say about temperature is that if you can swallow that, if you can say, all right, I give up applications that have to do with my cell phone and the convenience of, you know, a laptop on a train and you instead, for me, I'm, I'm very much in the scientific headspace. I'm not looking at products. I'm not looking at what this will be useful to sell to consumers. Instead, I'm thinking about scientific questions. Well, it's just not that bad to have to work at Fort Kelvin. We do it all the time in our labs at NIST. And so does, I mean, the, for reference, the entire quantum computing sector usually has to work at something like 100 millikelvin, 50 millikelvin. So now you're talking of another factor of 100 even colder than that, a mm. fraction of a, a degree. And everybody seems to think quantum computing is going to take over the world. Okay. That the, It's so much more expensive to have to get that extra factor of 10 or whatever colder and yet it's not stopping people from investing in, in that area. And by investing, I, I mean putting their research into it as well as venture capital or whatever. So- Oh, so, you, so based on the energy of what you're commenting on, I'm getting a sense that's one of the criticism of this approach is 4K, 4 Kelvin is, uh, is a big negative. It so. is the showstopper for a lot of people. Mm. They just, I mean, and understandably, I, I'm not saying that that that's not a consideration. Of course it is for, for some, okay. So different motivations for different people in the academic world. Suppose you spent your whole life learning about silicon microelectronic circuits. You, you send a design to a foundry, they send you back a chip and you go test it at your tabletop. Mm -hmm. And now I'm saying here now, how, learn how to use all these cryogenics so you can do that at four Kelvin. No, come on, yeah, man. Yeah, I want to yeah. do that. That sounds it's, it's, bad. It's the old momentum, the Titanic of the turning. Yeah, kind of. But you're saying that's not uh, too much of a finding when we're looking at large systems and the, and the gain you can potentially get from them. That's not that much of a cost. And when you want to answer the scientific question about what are the physical limits of cognition, well, the physical limits they don't care if you're at four Kelvin. If you can perform cognition at a scale orders of magnitude beyond any room temperature technology, mm -hmm. but you got to get cold to do it you're going to do it. And, and to me, that's the interesting application space. It's not even an application space. That's the interesting scientific paradigm. So I, I personally am not going to let low temperature stop me from realizing uh, a technological um, domain or, or realm that is achieving in most ways everything else that, I, that I'm looking for mm -hmm. in my hardware. So that, okay, that's a big one. Is there other kind of engineering challenges that you envision? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me take a moment here because I haven't really described what I mean by a neuron or a network in this particular hardware. Yeah, do you wanna talk about loop neurons? And there's so many fascinating ideas, but you just have so many amazing papers that people should definitely check out. And uh, the titles alone are just killer. So anyway, go ahead. Right, so let me say big picture, 
based on optics, photonics for communication, superconducting electronics for computation, how, how does this all work? So a neuron in this, in this hardware platform can be thought of as circuits that are based on Joseph's injunctions, like we talked about before, where every time a, a photon comes in, so let, let's start by talking about a synapse. A synapse receives a photon, one or more, from a, from a different neuron, and it converts that optical signal to an electrical signal. Mm -hmm. The amount of current that that adds to a loop is controlled by the synaptic weight. So as I said before, you're popping fluxons into a loop, right? So a, a photon comes in, it hits a superconducting single photon detector, one photon, the, the absolute physical minimum that you can communicate from one place to another with light. And that detector then converts that into an electrical signal and the amount of the signal is uh, correlated with the, some kind of weight. Yeah, so the synaptic weight will tell you how many fluxons you pop into the loop. It's an analog number. We're doing analog computation now. Well, okay, can you just linger on that? What the heck is a fluxon? Are we supposed to know this? Or is this a, is this a funny, uh, it's like the Big Bang. Is this, is this a funny word for something deeply technical? No, let's let's try to avoid using the word fluxon because it's not actually necessary. When a, when a, when a photon- <laughs> It's fun to say though. So, uh, so the, it's very necessary, I would say. When a, when a photon hits that superconducting single photon detector, yeah current is added to a, a superconducting loop. No. Okay. And the, the amount of current that you add can is an analog value. It can have eight bit equivalent resolution, something like that. 10 bits, maybe. That's amazing, by the way. This is starting to make a lot more sense. When you're using superconductors for this, the energy of that circulating current is, is less than the energy of that photon. So your 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 energy budget is not destroyed by doing this analog computation. Mm -hmm. So now in the language of, of a neuroscientist, you would say that's your postsynaptic signal. You have this current being stored in a loop. You can decide what you wanna do with it. Most likely you're gonna have it decay exponentially. So every single synapse is gonna have some given time constant. Mm -hmm. And that's determined by set, by putting some resistor in that in that superconducting loop. So a synapse uh, a synapse event occurs when a photon strikes a detector, adds current to that loop, it decays over time. Mm -hmm. That's the postsynaptic signal. Then you can process that in a dendritic tree. Bryce Primavera and I have a paper uh, that we've submitted about that. Um, for the more neuroscience oriented people, there's a lot of dendritic processing, a lot of plasticity mechanisms you can implement with essentially exactly the same circuits. You have this one simple building block circuit that you can use for a synapse, for a dendrite, for the neuron cell body, for all the plasticity functions. It's all based on the same building block, just tweaking a couple parameters. So, so this basic building block has both an optical and an electrical component, and then is, you could just build arbitrary large systems with that. Cl close, you're not at fault for thinking that that's what I meant. What I, what I should say is that if you want it to be a synapse, you tack a detector, a superconducting detector onto the front of it. Mm -hmm. And if you want it to be anything else, there's no optical component. Got it. So it, at the front, uh, <laughs> optics in the front, uh, electrical stuff in the back. Electrical, yeah, in the processing and in the, the output signal that it sends to the next stage of processing further. So, so uh, the dendritic trees is electrical. It's all electrical. It's all oh. electrical in the superconducting domain for Anybody who's up on their superconducting circuits, it's just based on a DC squid, the most ubiquitous, it's which is a circuit composed of two Joseph's injunctions. So it's it's a very bread and butter kind of thing. And then the only place where you go beyond that is the neuron cell body itself. It's receiving all these electrical inputs from the synapses or dendrites or however you've structured that particular unique neuron. And when it reaches its threshold, which occurs by driving a Joseph's injunction above its critical current, it produces a pulse of current, which starts an amplification sequence, voltage amplification, that produces light out of a, a transmitter. So one of one of our colleagues, Adam McCon and Sonia Buckley as well, did a lot of work on the the light sources and the amplifiers that drive the current and w produce sufficient voltage to drive current through that now semiconducting part. So that mm -hmm. light source is the semiconducting part of a neuron, and that. So the neuron has reached threshold, it produces a pulse of light. That light then fans out across a network of waveguides to reach all the downstream synaptic terminals that do perform this process themselves. So it's probably worth explaining what a network of waveguides is because mm -hmm. a lot of listeners aren't gonna know that. 
look up the papers by Jeff Childs on this one, but basically light can be guided in a, a simple, basically wire of usually an insulating material. So silicon, silicon nitride, different, different kinds of glass, just like in, in a fiber optic, it's glass, silicon dioxide. That makes it a little bit big. We want to bring these down. So we use different materials like silicon nitride, but basically just imagine a rectangle of some material that just goes and branches, um, forms different, different branch points that target different sub regions of the network. You can transition between layers of these. So now we're talking about building in the third dimension, which is absolutely crucial. So that's what waveguides are. So, yeah, well, that, that's great. Uh, what, why the third dimension is crucial? Okay, so th yes, you were talking about what are some of the technical limitations. One of the things that I believe we have to grapple with is that our brains are miraculously compact. For the number of neurons that are in our brain, it, it sure does fit in a small volume, as it would have to if we're going to be biological organisms that are resource limited and things like that. Any kind of hardware neuron is almost certainly going to be much bigger than that if it is of comparable complexity. Even whether it's based on silicon transistors, okay, a transistor seven nanometers, that doesn't mean a semiconductor based neuron is seven nanometers. They, they're big. They, they, they require many transistors, different other things like capacitors and things that store charge. They end up being on the order of a hundred microns by a hundred microns. And it's difficult to get them down any smaller than that. The same is true for superconducting neurons. And the same is true if we're trying to use light for communication. Even if you're using electrons for communication, you, you have these wires where okay, the, elect the size of an electron might be angstroms, but the size of a wire is not angstroms. And if you try and make it narrower, the resistance just goes up. So it, it, you don't actually win. To communicate over long distances, you need your wires to be microns wide. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing for waveguides. Waveguides are essentially limited by the wavelength of light, and that's going to be about a micron. So whereas compare that to an axon, the analogous component in the brain, which is 10 nanometers in diameter, something like that, they, they're bigger when they need to communicate over long distances. But grappling with the size of these structures is inevitable and crucial. And so in order to make systems of comparable scale to the human brain, by scale here, I mean number of interconnected neurons, you absolutely have to be using the third spatial dimension. And that means on the wafer, you need multiple layers of both active and passive components. Active, I mean superconducting electronic circuits that are performing computations. And passive, I mean these waveguides that are routing the optical signals to different places. You have to be able to stack those. If you can get to something like 10 planes of each of those, or maybe not even 10, maybe five, six, something like that, then you're in business. Now you can get millions of neurons on a wafer but that's not that's not anywhere close to the brain scale. In order to get to the scale of the human brain, you're going to have to also use the third dimension in the sense that entire wafers need to be stacked on top of each other with fiber optic communication between them. And we need to be able to fill a space the size of this table with stacked wafers. And that's when you can get to some 10 billion neurons like your human brain. And I, I don't think that's specific to the optoelectronic approach that we're taking. I think that applies to any hardware where you're trying to reach commensurate scale and complexity as the human brain. So you need that fractal stacking. So yes. stacking on the wafer and yes. stacking of the wafers and then whatever the system that combine this stacking of the tables with the wafers. And it has to be fractal all the way. You're exactly right, because that's the only way that you can efficiently get information from a small point to across that whole network. It has to have the, the power law connectivity. And photons are like uh, uh, optics throughout. Yeah, absolutely. Once you're at this scale, to me, it's just obvious. Of course, you're using light for communication. You have fiber optics given to us, you know, from nature, so simple. The, th the thought of even trying to do this, any kind of electrical communication just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. I'm not saying it's wrong. I don't know, but that's where I'm coming from. So let's return to loop neurons. Why are they called loop neurons? Yeah, the term loop neurons comes from the fact, like we've been talking about, that they rely heavily on these superconducting loops. So even in a lot of forms of digital computing with superconductors, storing 
a, a signal in a superconducting loop is a, a primary technique. In this particular case, it's it's just loops everywhere you look. So the the strength of a synaptic weight is going to be set by the state the amount of current circulating in a loop that is coupled to the synapse. So memory is implemented as current circulating in a superconducting loop. The the coupling between say a synapse and a dendrite or a synapse and the neuron cell body occurs through loop loop coupling through transformer. So current circulating in a synapse is going to induce current in a, in a different loop, a receiving loop in the, in the neuron cell body. So since all of the computation is happening in these flux storage loops, and they play such a, a central role in, in how the information is processed, how memories are formed, all that stuff. I didn't think too much about it. I just called them loop neurons because it rolls off the tongue a little bit better than superconducting optoelectronic neurons. Okay, so uh, how do you design circuits uh, for these loop neurons? That's a great question. There's a lot of different scales of design. So at the level of just one synapse, you can use conventional methods. They don't, they're not that complicated as, as far as superconducting electronics goes. It's just four Joseph's injunctions or something like that, depending on how much complexity you want to add. So you can just directly simulate each component in in spice we've what, been what spice it's standard electrical simulation software okay basically got it. so you're just you're just explicitly solving the differential equations that describe the circuit elements mm -hmm. and then you can stack these things together in that simulation software to, to then build circuits you can but that becomes computationally expensive so one of the things when when COVID hit we knew we had to turn some attention to more th things you can do at home in your basement or whatever and one of them was was <laughs> computational modeling. So we started working on adapting, um, abstracting out the circuit performance so that you don't have to explicitly solve the circuit equations, which for Joseph's injunctions usually needs to be done on like a picosecond time scale. And you have a lot of nodes in your circuit. So it, it results in a lot of differential equations that need to be solved simultaneously. We were looking for a way to simulate these circuits that is scalable up to networks of millions or, or so neurons is sort of where we're targeting right now. So we were able to analyze the behavior of these circuits. And as I said, it's based on these simple building blocks. So you really only need to understand this one building block. And if you get a good model of that, boom, it tiles. And you, you can change the parameters in there to get different behaviors and stuff, but it's all based on now it's one differential equation that you need to solve. So one differential equation for every synapse dendrite or neuron in your in your system and for the neuroscientists out there it's just a simple leaky integrate and fire model leaky integrator basically the, the a synapse is a leaky integrator a dendrite is a leaky integrator so i'm i'm really fascinated by how this one simple component can be used to achieve lots of different types of dynamical activity and uh, to me, that's where scalability comes from and, and also complexity as well. Complexity is often characterized by relatively simple building blocks connected in po potentially simple or sometimes complicated ways and then emergent new behavior that was hard to predict from those simple, simple elements. And that's exactly what we're working with here. So it's a very exciting platform, both from a modeling perspective and from a hardware manifestation perspective where we can hopefully start to, to have this uh, test bed where we can explore things not just related to neuroscience, but also related to other things that connect to, to other physics like critical phenomenon, Ising models, things like that. So you were asking how we simulate these circuits. It's, it's at different levels and we, we've got the simple spice circuit stuff that's no problem. And now we're we're building these network models based on this more efficient leaky integrator. So we can actually reduce every element to one differential equation. And then we can also step through it on a much coarser time grid. So it ends up being something like a factor of a thousand to 10,000 speed improvement, which allows us to simulate, but hopefully up to, up to millions of neurons. Um, whereas before we would have been limited to tens or hundreds, something like that. And just like uh, simulating quantum mechanical systems with a quantum computer, so the goal here is to understand such systems. For me, the goal is to study this as a scientific 
physical system. It, I, I'm not drawn towards turning this into an enterprise at, at this point. I, I so feel- short-term applications that obviously make a lot of money is not necessarily a dr uh, curiosity driver for you at the moment. Absolutely not. If you're interested in short-term making money, go with deep learning, use silicon microelectronics. If you want to understand things like the, the physics of a fascinating system, or if you want to understand something more along the lines of the physical limits of what can be achieved, then I think single photon communication, superconducting electronics, is extremely exciting. What if I want to use superconducting hardware at four Kelvin to mine Bitcoin? That's my main interest. That's that's the reason I wanted to talk to you today. I want to, no, I don't know. There's, what's there's, What's Bitcoin? <laughs> It's a, it's a, look it up on the internet. Somebody, somebody told me about it. I'm not sure exactly what it is.